It's, it's interesting that we, that I'm talking on the heart. Uh, sometimes when I go home at lunch, I just scan through and listen to different preachers, and it's amazing. Uh, I know of two different preachers right now that are doing series on the heart. And so I think that's something that the body of Christ is needing to hear, that your heart is very important. And we've learned over the past week or so that we are to guard our heart above everything else, above everything. Guard your heart because out of it proceeds all the issues of life. It's how you address every issue and stuff that you will face. We learned over the past couple of weeks that we have a body. Y'all heard the religious term that I use called a tripart person. Tripart means that I have a body. I have a soul. And remember what we learned about what the soul is. Our soul is our mind, will, and emotions. That's how we feel. That's how we uh, uh, react. Say like when the music's going, how we react. So our emotions. So we got our, again, our soul is our mind, our thoughts, my will, my willingness to interact, my willingness to do things, and my emotion. That's all made up of my soul. Then we learn that we have a spirit. That spirit's that part of us that connects with God. It's that ability for God to communicate with us. And I helped y'all understand, I hope I did clear enough, that some, the way our spirit is seen or noticed in a sense, it's our conscience. Our spirit and our conscience really are kind of the same. Our conscience is, is that part of us that comes in and when we know that we shouldn't be doing something. And by the way, you know, he says the sin is to know to do what's right and do it that not. That's sin. So let's just leave it at there. Okay, I'm not going to pick on issues. For you to know something particular to do, but you don't do it, your conscience comes in and tries to let you know that is not the way we want to do things. And there's where we get our internal turmoil that's within us. My conscience is coming in and in a sense, not condemning me as in being bad, but it's condemning the action, saying you don't need to do this. And that's where that internal turmoil resides within us. The difficult with that inner struggle, some people have said you're crazy by having that. You know, I hear voices. Well, we hear all kinds of voices. I hear my daddy say, boy, all the time, you know what I'm saying, or stuff that I've heard him through the years. So we hear voices, but because you hear voices don't mean you're crazy. That just means you're having an internal struggle going on within you because you may, may not be doing what you should be doing or going against what you should know about. So we have that internal I'm not going to say conflict, but it is a conflict that's going on within us. And what we want to learn today is move on a little bit further, go a little bit deeper, and so see how, how do I deal with that? When that's going on, how do, we deal, how do we do this? And this is not something that I'm just teaching. This is something that uh, I've experienced. Know this, that God wants your soul to be healthy. He does not want you to live in turmoil all the time. He wants you to be emotionally healthy. You got that? That's what he desired. Would that you prosper in being health even as your soul prospers. So as my emotions and my um, thoughts and my will is more it begins to line up with God's word and what I know truth is, I become more and more healthy when it becomes to dealing with this life. And look, let me say this before we move on. I was created, you were created, mankind was created to, in God's image. Not that we have a body like God, but we were created because God has a mind, will, and emotion. He created us that way where we could fellowship with him and also do what we needed to do in this world that we live in in a healthy way. Okay? So God created us in his image, and God's journey for you is for you to slowly work through all that back where you and God can fellowship and have fellowship like he always wanted 
in the beginning in our lives. Amen. So he's a journey and he loves us. And I like what I told somebody the other day. Some of us were like that old willow tree. You ever seen a willow tree? A willow tree down there by a pond? That bad boy will grow fast. Then you got an oak tree and it takes almost forever to get big. Amen. So I don't know which one you are. You may just be an old willow tree. Or you may be an oak tree. Either way, take on the journey. Amen. Look to your neighbor and say, take on the journey. Now, woman, don't look at your husband and do too stern like that. Be kind of nice with him. The sad, look at me. The sad, not sad, the difficulty thing is this. And I'm fixing to get wound up in a second. I'm just trying to lay some stuff down. The difficulty is this. Imagine us with a messed up soul, mind, will, and emotion. And it's messed up. It's full of perceptions, full of, full of issues, full of traumatic experiences, full of this. And based upon that, we're looking at people and judging them. How, how can something messed up judge somebody else? You see what I'm saying? So it's important for us to work through our issues. And once we work through those things, then we will lovingly help somebody get that speck out of their brother's eye in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me, let me read just the scripture here. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says it like this. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from the beginning to the end. The reason why so many people struggle and can't be happy in sin is because eternity, there's a place in us that only God can fulfill and bring us rest. And you can go do everything. Listen to me. You can go out there and live that life what you think to the fullest is. But only God can fit in that place. It's a place just for him. And when you learn to get settled down with that, oh, what a great life you'll begin to live. You won't live a boring life. I told somebody, who? A boring life? Think about it. My Lord, if you go to Hosanna, your husband probably begging you to come home or your wife begging you. I mean, we've got all kinds of stuff going on around here. There's no time for you to be bored if you want to be involved. But St. Augustine said it like this. To praise you is the desire of man, a little piece of your creation. You stir man to take pleasure in praising you. Because you have made us for yourself. And our heart, look at this right here, it's my favorite part. And our heart is restless until it rests in you. You hear me? We're restless. You'll stay up late at night running stuff through your head. But once you learn to rest in God, me, I promise y'all, you give me a pillow and let me lay over on my side, good night. I'll worry about the rest of the issues in the morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So we want to jump on in and see if we can't learn some uh, stuff. Wasn't that just an emotional journey this morning through praise and worship and all the songs? I tell you what, I, I, I put glasses on. I get tears on them. I put them back, clean them up, put them on my head, get tears, put them back on. It's, it's kind of hard. And I don't normally wear glasses except when I preach, but an emotional journey. All right, so today we want to. Look and see where it all started and see if we can't work through everything today. Amen. Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. And of course, I'll have them on the scripture, I mean on the uh, screen, but uh, write them down or just do something like that. Genesis 3, starting with verse 8. When the cool evening breeze were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He's talking about Adam and Eve. Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid, and I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked, the Lord asked. Have you eaten from the trees whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I did eat. How many country songs were written about that woman? Huh? A lot. A lot. Too many already. Then verse 13 says, uh, 
Then the Lord asked the woman, what have you done? And the serpent, uh, the, the, she blames it on the serpent. The, the, ser- the, the, uh, the serpent deceived me, she replied, and that's why I ate it. And so I want to talk about those two couple of questions there, and then we're going to move on a little bit. Number one I got here, when they were clothed in God's righteousness, they didn't realize they were naked. Before they fell, and they were clothed in God's righteousness, they had no idea that they were naked. They were, sub, they, they were not subconsciously confused. Y'all find me there? So before they fell, they were clothed in God's righteousness, completely created in God's image. I personally don't think they heard necessarily physically God walking in the garden. I just think they were subconsciously almost so connected with God, they sensed him walking towards them in the garden, okay? And so they were able to sense or heard God walking in the garden. In other words, listen to me. Before they messed up, they were more God conscience than they were sin conscience. They were God conscience more than they were self conscience. This world causes us to become self-aware rather than God-aware. I have to tell you, I personally despise beauty pageants because you got two judges determining who's beautiful and then kids by nature will walk around with the definition of what two judges gave about beauty. And if we ain't involved with our kids' life teaching them that this is just a, a formality that you go to, you'll go around your whole life now being aware that I'm not as beautiful as they are and I'll always be self-conscious worrying about how beautiful they are. I'm not as beautiful as they are. You see what I'm saying? So what happened is when they fell into sin, when Adam and Eve fell into sin, they shifted from being God conscious. They didn't even recognize each other was naked. They weren't critical of each other or anything like that to where they, when they fell in sin. So number two, when they sinned against what they knew what was right, they were ashamed and tried to cover themselves. So all of a sudden they subconsciously, their conscience begin to condemn them and let them know that they're doing wrong. And that is exactly what happens with us. Now that we now that if, if we don't become aware of with that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, we will subconsciously begin to condemn ourselves rather than just, rather than it being a good thing, don't do this. Now it's a bad thing, and we become conscious almost in sin, and we condemn rather than try to correct. Y'all hear what I'm saying there? So they were subconsciously beginning to condemn. They subconsciously become self-aware. I watch my families. There's mirrors all over the place in every office, and it's amazing. I don't know if it's just because I'm getting tired, old, and wrinkled. I don't want to look at myself in the mirror. I look and I'm like, oh, God, you know what I'm saying? I'm self-aware in that way. A lot of other people are self-aware. To, they look and all that kind of stuff, which is all great. But you better look at it through the eyes of who you are in Christ Jesus because you know what? You'll get upset the older you get. And ain't nothing you can do. Ain't enough Mary Kay. <laughs> or whatever all you makeup people say. Or ain't enough of it as you get too old in Jesus' name. You hear what I'm saying? So that's the... And the third thing I want you to notice here is, why did they try to hide from God? They were afraid of the consequences. God never laid the consequences out. He just said, if you eat a tree of knowledge, you, uh, actually the serpent tried to tell him what the consequences is, other than him saying, you shall surely die. So what surely died when they ate of the tree? That part of them that was created in God's image died and they had no more, in a sense, God awareness and that kind of stuff. So you see what I'm saying? So what's important is before they got messed up, they were, they were God conscious because they were wrapped in God's righteousness. The good news is today, if we accept what Jesus Christ done, we can be wrapped in his righteousness today and I can trust in what he's done rather than what I am doing in life because I will always get messed up here. See, their minds 
and their thoughts and their conscience were at odds with each other for the first time. Imagine that. For the first time, Adam and Eve, they were had a something going on with, that, with inside them, and that's a dangerous thing to be. In other words, what was created in God's image now was in default mode. Y'all follow me. They were in default mode, and we're going to try to help you how to fix this all here in just a minute. What was their reply to the question of God? Adam, notice what Adam said. See, Adam, it was the woman you gave me. Now, notice he said you. Technically, it wasn't a woman he was mad at. It he was God. It's God is the woman you gave me. In other words, if you wouldn't have given me this woman like this, I wouldn't be in this particular situation. Well, if you wouldn't have never sinned, she would have been your helpmate. But because they did what God did, wouldn't their helpmate become odds at each other? Now, y'all follow me. When they fell and messed up, they become at odds with each other in conflict. So let's keep on going, okay? All right? Genesis 3, 4 through 5 says it like this. This is right before this. Satan's talking to Adam and Eve, and he says it right here. You won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat of it, and you will be like God. They were already created in God's image. They already had God's mind, will, and emotion. They were already able to communicate with him. And the serpent comes along and says, you know, when you eat of it, you will be like God. Look what he says. Knowing both good and evil, your eyes will be open. And the word your eyes will be open means open to knowledge or understanding apart from God. So we are now in a state that we try to determine in our life what is morally right and what is morally wrong. We internally say it is okay for me to do this while my conscience is saying no it is not okay and that is how come we got so many people on medicine today that's why we got so many people being diagnosed bipolar, paranoid schizophrenic, all that we got so many people uh, diagnosed that and the real reality is this, we have somehow how I allowed ourselves to be we, we've tried to create a moral right and wrong apart from God and we've decided to do it for ourselves well let me ask you something and I got it here in one of my notes somewhere if you are trying to determine what's right or wrong and you are now trying to determine what's morally right or wrong what does that make you the God of your own world Instead of submitting ourselves to what God's word says and God's thought says, when I choose to submit to my thoughts and handle things my way because I inherited a lot of this stuff through life and uh, this stuff I didn't necessarily mean to do, but it's there. And I don't trust what God's word says and I trust what my thoughts or my mind and my will and emotions. When I begin to do that, guess what? There will be an internal conflict that you will live with. And you know what? God says, I want you to be whole and free from that kind of stuff. But you must trust the word of God and what the word of God says. And stop trying to fix things and fight things and thinking the world's against you. And I'm going crazy. Stop it. Stop it. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8 says it like this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you the right path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord, turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. See, what's going on is we've trusted in our own, I'm just going to be straight, we've trusted in our own moral beliefs over what God's belief says and that is how come we struggle so much internally and we get angry with ourselves and angry with people around them because we have created a moral standard for ourselves and we don't trust God. Let me 
kind of give you an example how this works. Hebrews 4, 13, 12 and 13, which I've already done, said this a couple times. Well, let's see how it works. Uh, verse 12 said, Hebrews 4, 12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. Although we've already talked about this, okay? It's sharper than the two, uh, sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit, between the jar, joint and marrow, and it exposes our innermost thoughts and desire. Let me see if I can't give you an example of this right quick. I did it in my CR group, and I'm going to see if we can't do this. How many ever had to go before in court, go to court? You go to court, you walk in, you all sit down. If you've done something wrong, you're over with the defense, uh, defensive attorney. And you got off, uh, uh, I call it a district attorney, but it is a district attorney, but what's the real word of pro, uh, prosecuting attorney, okay? You all right, little buddy? Prosecuted attorney. So let's think about it like this, okay? Well, who do you think the prosecuting attorney would be when it comes to your soul and your mind, will, and emotions? Your heart. Your heart. Your, so the prosecuting attorney would be what? Your conscience. Right? Can say, and you shouldn't have done this. Your def uh, defense attorney, or whatever his name is, is over here. What do you think it is? It's your thoughts, your mind and will and emotions. So you got one accusing you, and you got one saying, no, I'm defending me. Well, guess what there is? There's a judge. The judge is the word of God. The judge is the discerner. He's trying to determine which one of you folks telling the truth here. And that is exactly what the Word of God does. The Word of God comes in and deals with your emotions, your thoughts, your mind. And he also helps with your conscience to chill out a little bit. And we begin to walk in the truth of what God's Word says because both of them are at odds with each other. And that's what it goes on within us every day. So how is the word of God useful for us? What, what, how does the word, if the word comes in and divides the soul and the spirit, how is the word of God useful for us? Let's talk about it here. 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17 says it like this. You have been taught the scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God. And look what it says here. It is useful to teach us what is true. And makes us realize what is wrong in our life. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Every preacher I know and pastor uses that to use bully pulpit to put on people to tell them, look, I'm going to stand up and correct you and make you help you do what's right. But that is not what really the word of God's coming to do. It's coming in here to personally, internally deal with it. So number one, what the word of God does, the usefulness of the word of God in my life. Number one, it, the, word, uh, the word of God teaches us. What does it mean teaches us? The word of God comes into our life. That's why it's important to know the word. The word of God comes into our life and guess what it does? It exposes false perceptions that I have. You got that? The word of God, if we were really read it, mainly from a righteousness conscience. In other words, I am righteous because of what Jesus done. I can allow the word of God to come in and deal with my false belief system and mindsets. He's not coming to condemn. He's coming to expose. This is, what, this is why you keep getting into the same situation. This is why you have a tendency to do the same thing. This is why your life's kind of crappy and it's going to stay crappy until we learn to adjust some of these things. It's coming to expose. Now, if you don't understand the righteousness of God, you just close the book and stop because you don't feel like another somebody telling you wrong. But if I know who I am in Christ Jesus, I can open up the book, look what the book says and say, wow, I have been doing that. And this hadn't led me anywhere that I need to go. It exposes things. Not in a condemning way. It exposes what's going on in my heart and the reasons why I do certain things. 
Number two, the Word of God helps you realize what's wrong in your life. One is exposing, the next is coming in, and what's, it helps you see what's wrong. It helps you. It, it, it. Have you ever had somebody say something to you and then it just makes sense? You, you ever? It clicks. I remember for years doing electrical work. My dad would try to teach me how to do a switch leg. A switch leg is where you turn the switch on and turn it on and off. You know, you got power coming in and you got to get power up to the light. And for it just took me a while. I just didn't under, I couldn't comprehend what was going on. And then one day it just clicked. It made sense. That's what the Word of God does for you. You keep reading and studying it from a righteousness God's not mad, not, not mad at me standpoint, guess what? One day you read it and it just, <laughs> that's the dumb reason I keep doing all this crazy stuff. When something makes sense, it have, you have more of a tendency to move on, don't you? But when you don't understand why, you know, it's what Paul said, the things I don't want to do, I do, and the very things I don't want to do, I, you know, I find myself doing. When there's certain things in life, as we read the Word of God, and I want to say it again, from the standpoint that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, from the standpoint He provided salvation to me, God is not upset and mad. I can begin to read the Word of God, and it will show me what is wrong, and He will help it make sense to me why it's wrong that's the awesomeness because when it clicks with you you may try to explain it to everybody else and they're looking at you like you're crazy but God has done something in your heart to help you understand why this is why it is and it makes sense to you my wife's like that a lot of time I say baby just know this you start talking to people about that kind of stuff they're going to look at you like you're Sometimes when God reveals stuff to us and helps us see the reasons why we're doing certain things, it just makes sense. And when it makes sense, it's easier to just stop doing things. Number three, as we learn and grow in the Word of God, this is all out of 2 Timothy, we will be prepared and equipped to do the work what he says the only reason why he's exposing the only reason why he's trying to help you make sense because when it all begins to make sense and it all begins to be exposed all he's trying to do is equip you for you to be healthy in your spirit healthy in your mind that way we can go out there in the world and slowly help people and talk to people and help them understand the good news of what God's done and try to help people he, he's going to equip us he, he's going to allow you to go through certain circumstances in life that way you'll be able to talk to somebody that's been through there been there and done that let me tell you what God can do let me tell you where he's brought me through but guess what some of you don't even understand the righteousness of God. Therefore, when you start reading the Word of God, it does not make sense to you. You don't want to have nothing to do with it because it's exposing stuff. And you're like, just, I'm, I just got to close the book. It's too much for me today. But when you begin to read it from another viewpoint, this is kind of how it goes for me. Whew, that's a pretty deep one, God. I don't know. I don't know. Ah, man, they pushing me to the limit. You got to help me. He said, that's all I was asking you for. You truly recognize, and this is an area in your life uh, that you're in trouble with. That's the goodness of God. And I promise you this. He won't expose nothing too early. You'll read that passage 15 times and never click. And then one day, you read it, and it makes sense because God prepared you for that moment. God prepared you for to be able to receive and understand what he wants. And he's, uh, he's equipping you. And I beg you as a pastor, don't throw in the towel on the journey. Just keep walking. Keep growing. God will send somebody your way to help it make sense. One day you'll open up the book and you really wasn't even. You're just doing your thing. You're just reading. And bam, the scriptures will jump out. And you're wow, wow, that, ooh, that's a good one. Here, let me get my phone and type that in and try to remember that thought. If you like Brother Rayford, you pull the pad out, flip it open, and start writing it down. 
He's got stacks of books that tall where God just opened up the goodness to him. And he didn't go to uh, four-year seminary colleges and stuff. He went to little Bible college like I did. It wasn't just revelation of what the Holy Spirit, and that's what he wants to do with you in your life. Let me show you something else, okay? So number one, he wants to teach us. Number two, he wants to help us recognize things. Number three, he wants to prepare us. That's what it's all about. And guess what? I am so proud of some of you. You're using Facebook to reach this world. Instead of putting junk stuff, you, I love all the evangelists I got in my church. Y'all are reaching more people than I ever dreamed even standing up on this platform. I'm just going to teach you, talk to you. You get on Facebook. You use it for the kingdom of God. You glorify God. Say stuff to people all over the place and get her done because I type bad I type stuff I'm trying to read on this little screen here and I can't see and my daughters that text me daddy, daddy you spelt two wrong <laughs> you, you know I'm getting that it's supposed to be T-O-O -O. I don't care maybe they get the point <laughs> and I thank God for my daughters helping me stay straight that's why I say y'all go get your education because your daddy didn't so y'all be able to help him in the future so let's move on to one more passage and we'll get out of here. And I want y'all to get this. He wants to teach us. He wants us to help us recognize things. And it's all by getting the word of God, okay? Now let's go to 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6. This is powerful stuff. For the weapons of our warfare, that's Christians. That's yours. The weapons of your warfare, the what you got, are not carnal. So you've been battling things from your old carnal issues for years. You know what I'm talking about. Some men, all you know is don't jack with me, I'll punch you in the face. You know what I'm saying? But look, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds in our mind. Us, strongholds we've got. Look what he says here. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So let's look at this word. Uh, 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 pulling down stronghold, strongholds. Strongholds are any points or arguments which one trusts in. And I mean, let's just get it like this. We've, 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 we've had some crazy lives, haven't we? So we got some crazy stuff in our head. Let's just be, we got some crazy stuff in our head. You're just listening to much music nowadays. You got crazy stuff in your head. Right? Those strongheads, these mighty weapons that God has given us can deal with those strongholds that are in our mind. Strongholds. Everybody say strongholds. So the first thing we got to do, number one, the scripture says, casting down imaginations. The word imagination there, in other words, number point one is stop imagining things that you are no wrong. That's what you got. Number one is you've got to stop imagining things in your brain that you're allowing to go over and over in your brain that is not right. You've got to stop it. You hear me? Every day, you, when stuff starts repeating in your brain, and you're, you got to stop it. The word imagination means reasonings that are hostile to the Word of God or what you know to be truth. Whether you know the Word of God, there's things that you internally know is not right. And look what he says. You need to stop imagining things. You ever seen how imagination works? Ladies, you ought to know how well that is. I mean, your husband didn't pick his shoes up, didn't take out the trash. My Lord, tracked dirt all through the house you just cleaned. Left that bowl of cereal over on the sink. Could at least put it down the sink. Destroyed the living room. And don't you dare let people in our house because it's not very clean right now. And what happens is you sit there and you're, you're imagining it. You're like, and when he walks through that door, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to tell him just how it is. You know, I'm going to tell him I'm not his maid. I tell you what, it takes two to the tango. I tell you, what, I'm so sick of this right here. Blah, blah, blah. And what you're doing, you're creating imaginations about everything that you're going to do before they ever. I mean, you're imagining, even though you wouldn't punch him, you imagine yourself just cold cocking him, you know what I'm saying? Knee driving like the junk hard dog, you know. You're imagining all these things, what's going on, you know what I'm saying? He walks in and he just. And bam! Boop, boop, boop. You know, you know, y'all, y'all, how many can say amen? You know what I'm saying? Look at me. Look what he said. Look, look, look what God's word says here. Casting down imagination. That word casting down means to tear down. Take, uh, to take down, to tear down, demolish, dethrone. Is it worth your imagination's going crazy to destroy your relationship when it's coming in? Is it worth it? And instead of us, and look at me, that is a violent term. These are hostile actions. That means when I'm, when I'm feeling tempted to go drink something, if I have a tendency to go there, you don't play around with it. You don't say, well, I could only drink one. You, know, you don't go there. I mean, if you've got addiction issues and all that, you just don't go there. You tear it down. No. If you, whatever it is you deal with, just no, 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 no. Already, I, I, Lord has showed me how it's destroyed my life in the past. It's showed me how I've destroyed my children. It has showed me how I've destroyed multiple relationships over and so no, no, stop it. No, no, I ain't, no, I ain't even going there. Number two, every high thing exalts itself against the knowledge of, 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 of God, of, against the knowledge of God a high thing is everything that rises up or more specifically all pride that rises up in opposition pride 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 in our life exalts itself and pride is got all kinds of different area Pride says, if I do this right here, people are not going to like me. And so I lift myself above what I know I should do. Pride. If I, if I say, no, guys, I don't want to do that. I'm going to head on to the house. Pride says, well, they're going to think this about me. Pride. Something that you know to be the truth. Pride. 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 Sir, when you know, you should just apologize. You know you're dead wrong. Just apologize. And be honest with her. Just say, hey, man, I'm, I get kind of stupid sometimes. Better than that. Cast down the pride stuff before it begins to happen. It's like me. I hate the trash can. I thank God for Brother Rayford. I throw a bag of trash in my truck, and he'll come out, I'll drive in on Monday morning, and say, you want me to deal with it? Yes, sir, you'd be awesome. <laughs> back in the day, we just went to the backyard because we had a hole cut in the ground, and you throw the trash in there, and you burn it. Now you got to walk 500 yards down to the road with a bag of trash. That's, it's, what happens at my house? It's just like one day we decide to clean the refrigerator. <laughs> she dumps everything that half of you folks have brought us to eat. And we ain't finishing this stuck all in our bags. And it's like I got to drag this bag. <laughs> the whole time I'm thinking, this is stupid. Why can't we do this one at a time? And then I got to try to pick this heavy bag up and throw it in the back of my truck. <laughs> you know, throw it back there. Get down to the bottom of the hill. My mother-in-law's done filled my trash can with all her trash. <laughs> and she's back here in the corner. I love her, but she fills my trash can up something. You know what I'm saying? Then I got to go down to Rodney and say, <clears throat> I think I could throw some trash in the back of your truck. 
I mean, the back of your, in your thing. Sure, preacher. I get there, his is full. So I got four or five bags. I can remember when I was a youth pastor, I left so many bags of trash of diapers from you two. Brother Rayford would just shake his head at me. I had trees growing in the back of my truck. I had so much junk and stuff, huh? And I've tried to do better since then. But I thank God that brother, God sent Brother Rayford with me. 30 years, he's been helping me. Hey, if you did any good, you helped me keep the trash out of the back of the truck. Even, it's a joke. It, it's a joke when the, uh, Shane and James get in my truck. They say, you can, they can tell Brother Rayford hadn't went on a drive with you lately. Because I had Coke bottles and everything else sticking there. So thank you very much, Brother Rayford. But high things. Getting aggravated. You know, Damon, just take the trash out. What is it that big of a deal? You know what I'm talking about? And the next one it says, look at it. Look what it says here. Uh, the scripture. And bring in the captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Okay? The word obedience means when, you, when you've been unwilling to hear. Obedience, that's what it says. When you've been unwilling to hear. When you finally decide to hear, like take the trash out, you got to be ready to retaliate against your disobedience. Huh? <laughs> I know. You're right, God. Should have took this trash out. I'll tell you what. Because you start to say, I'll tell, tell you what, you, when you start cooking supper and stuff, I'll start taking the trash out. You know, it's the woman you gave me, God. If she'd have done that, I'd have had the trash out yesterday. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Come on. Then finally, Brandy learned to do this. I'd be sitting over on the couch drinking coffee or something, and she's dragging the trash out like I. I'm like, oh, you know you didn't. Right in front of me. You did that on purpose, didn't you? <laughs> you trying to make me feel bad. Now, if you won't take it out, take it out. Okay, all right. You convinced me. I'm going to start taking the trash out. And then what's hard is, it's one thing when the trash bag gets full and taking it out, but you got one of them new fancy things that you wave your hand and it pops open. Well, that's hard, pulling that off, putting that new bag down in there and wrapping it around the rim and putting all that back on. That's hard. Why can't we just have a trash can, a normal trash can? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I know. It's so, this trash stuff is killing me, man. I'm serious. It's hard. Brother Rayford, do you think you could come visit me and once a week at my house and help me with the trash in my house? So look at me. We got to be willing or be prepared to strike back when you realize your reasoning is hostile towards the Word of God. No. No. Stop imagining it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop imagining the drugs if you're one of those people that deal with that. Stop imagining what you're going to do in the relationship. Stop imagining if you had this man, it would be so much better. If you had this woman, it would be. Stop it. Stop the imagination. Bring a death punch to where you know what you're thinking is wrong. Deal with it. Don't let it hang around. You, mm, mm, mm. Oh, Lord, let me say something right here. If you deal with pornography, as soon as it pops up, Turn it off. Every day, it just pops up on my phones and stuff. Every day. And what you got to learn to do is just turn it off. Stop. And I'm not going to do that. Now, that's not a pride thing because I could mess up tomorrow. But I don't want that. That that will destroy. I've seen that destroy people and destroy things. Not only that, it would destroy my wife. And you know what? I'm just not going to do that. I'm just not going to do it. Kill that joker. Take it out. So real quickly, and I'm closing out here. So how can I grow in the Word of God? That's those things. Be ready to do that. But I got some stuff here. How do I, how do I start reading the Word of God? If it were me, start with the book of John. Just read through the book of John. It's easiest. It's, it's, 
It's easy. Read the book of John. See how Jesus handled people. Really look at it. I mean, think about it. You told some preacher says you're going to go to hell because you had a bad thought. But if you'll read it, you'll figure out that ain't what he was saying. Just read it. Start, don't, please don't start in Genesis and get into Leviticus, please. You'll never read again. It's like, why are they sacrificing so many people? All right, so many things. Get into the book of John. Read the book of John. I would encourage you to go into what we call the epistles. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Colossians, Philippians. That's a letter that Paul was writing to churches that had issues just like Hosanna has issues. All these other churches don't think they have issues. They're crazy. You know? They jump churches from left to right because, well, anyway, anyway. All those is you just read it, study it, and say, you know what? If the Ephesians were dealing with that kind of stuff, I don't want to do it. I, 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 man, if Paul's telling them not to do it, guess what? I'm not going to do it. So read. I love reading reading the pro, a book of Proverbs. Read it in an easy translation. I know you think Jesus spoke King James, but he didn't. <laughs> Do you hear me? Jesus didn't speak King James. This is the kind of legal, uh, tell me to hurry, y'all say hurry up preacher. This is the kind of stuff I, when I first got saved. Buddy, if you left your Bible on the counter next to you and you accidentally put your cup on it you were going to hell if you allow dust to form on it you going to hell that is God's word hallelujah and you should know and don't respect God and if you do God's going to blow out your tire God cares more about you than he does a written piece of paper. That written piece of paper is for you to grow. But God cares about you and he cares about people. Move on to the next point. Now, the next thing is listen to a podcast. Now looking, us old folks, I just recently found out what a podcast was. Podcast is like a CD or a cassette tape. Remember when you used to listen to preaching on cassette tape? Well, a podcast is the exact same thing. But you go to a place like Spotify, which we now have. Hosanna, now we have podcasts. Whatever that is, you can go to it and you can listen to other people's messages. Spotify. No, what is a podcast? It's like having a cassette tape. For you one a little bit older, it's like having a CD. It's a podcast on your phone. You can listen. And guess what? There's some great preachers. Tony Evans. Tony Evans is a great, just straight out, balanced preacher that you can listen to. Andrew Wellmack, uh, excellent, straight out, just great preaching. They're not trying to manipulate you, trying to get your money. They're just great preachers. Uh, Tony Evans. You can go the U version on your phone. Please just learn to get U version app on your phone. If you got a smartphone, U version. It gives you Bible devote. You can listen to it. Connect it to your car as you're driving down the road or your air buds or your air pops, whatever they're called. You can do all that kind of thing. I don't get all that, man. You know, I'm just turn it up, crank it up, what I like already. Uh, right Now Media. We got a free service called Right Now Media in our church. You sign up for it. There's thousands of books there that will read it, not just a book. It's a, a person standing there, and they do a devotion, a podcast. All that. It's all there for you, free. Get into it. And my last one is just be ready to retaliate. You hear me? Just no. No, 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 no. Ain't doing that no more. You hear me? It's like sticking your tongue to a refrigerator. How many of you ever done that? Y'all ain't never stuck your tongue to a freezer and it got stuck on there? Please tell me. Is there anybody? Well, I should have known Melanie and me were the one who got it. You know? So there's only... Do it when you get home. Just, <laughs> when you get home, just open up the refrigerator and that little metal bar runs across there. She, <laughs> make sure you got your wife around you or your or mama and when you do because it will stick there and tear all the little hair off the top of your tongue. Shut up, Damon. Let's get up. Everybody stand up. Yeah, hey, look. For a disclaimer, do not stick your tongue 
to that, okay? Because it will pull, you too, do not, don't you do it. You said not a little ears. Your tongue will stick to it. And it will be bad. I can't believe only three of y'all are lying. Well, I want you to, st let's all stop right now and I want your conscience, we're going to do that one more time. If your conscience is telling you you lying and you had the pride to say I wasn't that ignorant, I don't want nobody to know I was that dumb, there's pride coming in, you can't tell me anymore. You, you know you stuck your tongue to a refrigerator. Brother Rayford, you, stung your, you stuck your tongue there, have you? Uh, you had a freezer? Well, let's pray. Father, we love you and we are so grateful for salvation that teaches us and loves us and care for us through the person of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Lord, I love living and pastoring a group of people who love to grow, love to hear your word, loves to worship, loves to fellowship. Again, we thank you for a great salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, God love you. Make sure you shake somebody's hand.